It's Monday afternoon, and as promised, I will be recapping everything that you need to know from all of these preseason games every Monday. This is the last one of the summer, of course, but we'll continue into the regular season. So if you are a fantasy football head, you want to stay on top of football, then subscribe for this reason, if no other reason. Every single Monday, recapping everything that happens over the weekend in this beautiful sport that we call football, okay? In this video, we are going to talk about utilization. We love that word in fantasy football, okay? So when I'm recapping everything important that you need to know for your fantasy football drafts, the key takeaways are always going to be utilization with the starting quarterback. We want to know who is on the field when the starting quarterback is on the field. I don't care how you performed against second and third string players on the opposite team. Everyone's going to be like, ah, the Jaguars beat the Falcons 31 nothing, and Evan Ingram scored two touchdowns. Do you know how bad the Falcons defense is to begin with? They didn't play any of their starters. And now you got second and third string defensive backs and 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 D line for the already worst D line in the league. I'm good. And on that note, because we are in week three of the preseason and the next games that we see are regular season games, there were a ton of teams that did not play any starters, any fantasy relevant starters. So I will start off by listing those teams first. So when I don't talk about your favorite team and why your fourth string wide receiver wasn't brought up in the video, it's because they didn't have a starting quarterback and it doesn't fucking matter. Those teams. Or the Bengals, the Bears, the Chiefs, the Falcons, the Dolphins, the Raiders, the Bills, the Lions, the Ravens, the Packers, the Vikings, the Eagles, the Rams, the Giants, the Saints, the Cardinals, the Broncos, Commanders. None of those teams played any fantasy relevant starters. We got 25 snaps from Anthony Richardson, and he put together a really nice first drive. And then after that, it, it's funny how an entire offseason of, you know, hype and not seeing anyone play football can amount to whatever narratives and storylines they amount to. But one of them is is just kind of forgetting about how sporadic Anthony Richardson is as a thrower. And I'm just I'm just mentioning this, you know, I'm just talking football with y'all. This is not a huge takeaway or anything like that. It doesn't make me not want to draft Anthony Richardson. But if you watch this game, the amount of like bone headed plays he made, uh, whether it was the pick six, whether it was overthrowing A.D. Mitchell uh, two to three times on that second drive, whether it was getting stripped on a run outside. Like, I'm just I'm just kind of coming back into the zone. Like, we haven't seen a rich play in, in over a year. And even before that, he didn't have a lot of experience. Um, I will say the offense looks smooth in theory. Like, the receivers are open. Whoever's playing the slot is open all the time. Michael Pittman is obviously a full-time player. Uh, A.D. Mitchell and Alec Pierce are splitting a lot of snaps. Josh Downs is apparently on track to suit up in early September. They won't say he'll be ready for week one, but apparently the rehab from the high ankle sprain is looking good, and he should be back on the field sooner rather than later. He will be a full-time slot player, but I do think this could be good for A.D. Mitchell off the rip because he's playing a lot of snaps and a lot of snaps out of the slot. So of the 25 snaps for Anthony Richardson, A.D. Mitchell played on 24 of 25. You're talking about a 96% rate, and that wasn't really at the expense of Alec Pierce because he also played 88% of the snaps. It was kind of reminiscent of the Rams back when Sean McVay came into the league and they were running 11 personnel on like 97% of their snaps. And it was just Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, Brandon Cooks, right? And they were like unstoppable at this time. So it kind of feels like this might be the offense that they're looking to run. Uh, JT looks great as well. And they are going to feed that man this year. No massive takeaways there, but I will say as we move down the list, there weren't any huge injuries to note. There weren't any huge ranking changes overall because you see so few actually fantasy relevant players playing in week three. But I will say some some quick house notes before we get deeper into the video. We just heard the announcement today that Nick Chubb is staying on the pup list, so he will not be able to be active for the first four games of this season, which is crazy to me because we didn't we saw a video of him walking last week. Unreal. He was walking. How can he? How how is he not back to full strength and have crazy upside this year in fantasy? Insane. Won't get four weeks out of Nick Chubb. That means at minimum we won't get four weeks. He might not play till week six, eight. We don't know. But he's gone for four weeks. The Chiefs re-signed Juju Smith-Schuster. Does this affect anything? Literally, no. He just got cut from arguably the worst receiving group in the entire NFL. So I, I can't believe I've even wasted ten seconds on a on a Juju Smith-Schuster note or report. Thirdly, I think it's kind of interesting. And it was the last game of the night last night. Jacoby Brissett was the starter for New England once again, and then Drake May came in and played 30, 35 snaps. Now, uh, Jared Mayo came onto a radio station in New England yesterday, and he said uh, it's a true competition, obviously talking about the QB situation. It's a true competition, and I would say at this current point, Drake has outplayed Jacoby. Now, we have to take in the full body of work going way back to the spring and the beginning of training camp. We'll see where we end up. That's 
sounding like they're starting to lean into May's favor. So take note of that. And it probably also means that even if they give Jacoby the nod, his leash is going to be extremely short. So it almost feels like it went from a situation where it was like, we're only playing Drake May when we feel he's really, really ready to, okay, now it's, and, and, and not so much like, it doesn't matter how Jacoby is performing. It's not like a, oh, we're trying to win a bunch of games. So if Jacoby starts performing subpar, we're going to throw Drake May in. It, it felt like it was more like only dependent on Drake May. When he was ready, we'll put him in. Not so much like when Jacoby starts playing poorly, then we'll switch quarterbacks. Now it feels like it's kind of, you know, the tide is shifting a little bit there. The other thing to note, though, too, is Drake May, while he's played really well his preseason, this was definitely the best he's looked. Again, he is the second quarterback coming off the bench. And by the time he's in the game, they played against the Commanders last night. And the Commanders, you know, you want to talk about the Falcons having a bad defense. I mean, they they make the Commanders or the Commanders make the Falcons look like an, a, an elite defense by the way they fucking play. So you're talking about backups for the Washington Commanders. Like, I would hope Drake May can command a team against them. But let's jump back up to some wide receivers that I'm kind of taking note of and probably moving up my rankings. The first team we're starting with is the Jaguars. We got a nice little dosage of Trevor Lawrence which we have throughout the offseason so far. Christian Kirk did not play in this one uh, against the, the Falcons, but Trevor Lawrence tore us up. More importantly, the utilization for Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas continues to be super strong. They seem like they're gonna, both going to be playing 80 to 90% of the snaps throughout the entire regular season. So I think like I hate Gabe Davis and I don't want to draft him in fantasy, but if you're doing underdog drafts and you're doing best ball drafts right now and he continues to go at like the 11th, 12th, 13th round whatever wherever he's going he's a good pick because he's just going to be on the field all the time and he will kind of just like fumble into big plays with Trevor Lawrence's arm and Brian Thomas Jr. obviously has insane upside so a rookie like him explosive guy like we might not even need to wait for him to actually get onto the field to like see some of that upside he might start making plays from from day one and he's going I want to say he's going behind like these other rookies like Lad McConkey and Keon Coleman and stuff like he feels like one of the best values at the rookie wide receiver position right now. So BTJ should be a target for you in the 8th, ninth, 10th round of, of all your drafts. On that note, you want to talk about another receiver really like climbing up rankings right now. Might be my biggest riser, and that is Jalen McMillan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, I'm working on a video right now that is like 10 players you have to stash on your bench before week one starts. I made this video last year, and on the top of that list was Puka Nakua and Jaden Reed. I'm trying to identify those types of players this year the clear similarity between those types of players are these talented guys that we don't know who the what the role is going to be but as the summer is moving closer and closer to the kickoff we start to have a much clearer role for them right like we now know that Jalen McMillan has won the wide receiver three role Jalen McMillan can play inside and outside he is playing 100 percent of the snaps with the first team offense that's what we saw in this one in the Bucks and Dolphins game so it's Mike Evans and Chris Godwin of course but if something would happen to Chris Godwin, Jalen McMillan would be a target hog in this offense. So McMillan's another rookie target that you want to be kind of scooping up at the end of your drafts that your league mates are probably not going to know much about. He was the third guy in Washington behind, you know, Rome, behind Jalen Polk, behind those two guys. So he kind of goes as an afterthought because he had a little bit of a down season. But Jalen McMillan is, is very talented. And I think he fits this offense well with versatility, kind of meeting in the middle of Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. We finally saw Bryce Young get onto the field, which is kind of insane that we waited all the way until right now, considering he had a terrible rookie year. They bring in new weapons for him to, to have cohesion with. They have a new head coach in Dave Canales, a new offensive system, a new scheme, and this is the first time we're really seeing him on the field playing. And he'll worry up. I will say two things that I walked away from in this game. It's clearly Deontay Johnson is the wide receiver one there. I don't think anyone's questioned that. I don't think anything has changed there. He is the alpha in terms of playtime, at least. But Adam Thielen has unrightfully been left for dead this year. And I've kind of been throwing his name out as a, as a late round pick in most of my videos leading up till this point. So with Bryce Young, we got 12 snaps from him. Deontay played all 12 of them. Adam Thielen played 11 of 12. Jonathan Mingo played 8 of 12. Xavier Leggett played 2 of 12. So Thielen is very clearly ahead of those two younger high upside guys. And Thielen's routes included snaps in both 11 personnel and 12 personnel. I know a lot of people are probably assuming that Thielen would be 
a slot guy only, but they trust Thielen, man. He's a veteran. He is one of the only players in this offense that actually has chemistry with Bryce Young. He literally went for 1,000 yards last year. I know he flamed out at the end of the year, but he's still going to be running a ton of routes. He's still going to be probably his safety valve over the middle of the field. Like Deontay Johnson is going to have to operate on the outside and have to get separation over there. When Bryce Young is under pressure, it's probably going to Thielen. They don't have like a great tight end to dump the ball off to. They don't have these playmakers over the middle outside of Thielen that are going to get targets. So Thielen needs to be a target in the 14th, 15th, 16th round of your leagues, especially in PPR type leagues. The other takeaway I had here is something that I felt like we've known all summer is that Chuba Hubbard is going to open the season as a workhorse. He played every single down with Bryce Young. Obviously, Jonathan Brooks is not playing yet. He's still recovering from that late November, early December ACL tear. We're still awaiting to to hear his pup status entering the year. As I said, Nick Chubb's going to stay on the pups. So that's four games. I would be, I'm a little bit more optimistic that Jonathan Brooks won't, but I also won't be surprised if he does end up on the pup and he's there for the first four games and you can't do anything with him. Chuba Hubbard will get a ton of work over the first four. He would probably average 18 to 20 opportunities. He is kind of like the perfect veteran running back to target because he's not expensive, right? You don't have to take him in like the the Najee Harris, Tony Pollard tier of like eighth, ninth round. Chuba's like a 12th, 13th round pick because everyone assumes he's he's going to be wiped out. And that's probably the case over the second half of the year. If that, uh, he's a great pick to pair with some of these high upside rookie backs that we don't expect to get a lot of play early on. So taking a dude like, you know, using your 12th, 13th, 14th round picks on Chuba and then like Trey Benson or Chuba and then Marshawn Lloyd, like those types of players, you know, even like Chuba and then, I don't know, Josh Downs or Jalen Polk or something like that, where if you're looking at it from less position and more like a flex kind of fill in type beat over there. I think that works really well too, because Chuba will get a ton of work early on. You'll be able to flex him. You'll be able to play him in your RB2 role. And then as the season progresses, I think talent eventually wins out. I think this will become more of a committee and I'm not expecting Brooks to have a major breakout this year, but it will get to the point eventually over the second half of the year where it's like you just have two guys in a committee that don't, that don't produce a lot of fantasy points as individuals. So we'll get to that point eventually, but you can prepare for it early on. Moving down the list, Russell Wilson and the starters had a single drive. Cordy P still got it, ripped off a 30-yard touchdown run to, to get in there. The only real takeaway I had here is like George Pickens just continues to make plays every fucking time he's on the field. And I know everyone just keeps saying like it's going to be a low passing volume offense. There's no way he can be, you know, an 8, 9, 10 target per game guy. And I think there's part of me that agrees with that. But this dude has a 33% target share with the starters so far this preseason. Like he is getting screens. He's getting downfield shots. Like he is the go-to playmaker. And that's of course going to be the case when Van Jefferson is your wide receiver two. Calvin Austin, the third is their wide receiver three right now. The fake talented rookie Roman Wilson is, has been dealing with a minor ankle injury for like six months and has virtually cost him the entire summer. So he's not going to make an impact this year. Uh, their passing offense is, is literally just George Pickens. So he's kind of like the first tier of receivers where I break my rule in fantasy drafts and I'm saying, okay, you know, the first bunch of rounds, I'm just making sure I'm not taking players on bad teams. Once you get to rounds five, six, seven, that's where you can kind of open up the Rolodex a little bit. And Pickens is like one of the first guys. I'm like, all right, you know what? I will break that rule a little bit and I will start to look at like talent and upside over situation, right? I'm usually using that kind of substance or that kind of analysis as a tiebreaker, okay? And that's actually one of my favorite parts about our draft guide, which is live right now. If you have a draft from now until season kickoff, all of our rankings, they are fully updated after week three preseason in the draft guide right now. And one of the cool tools that we have available for you guys is what we're calling the tiebreaker matrix. And for each player, you can compare multiple players together that are near each other in the rankings and look at things like team total wins per Vegas, whether or not they're playing in two wide receiver, three wide receiver sets, a bunch of like underlying stats like that, offensive line rankings, offensive pace, things like that, that help you make that tiebreaker decision when you're on the clock. So a guy like George Pickens kind of goes against some of the attributes in there, but he's like the first tier of that, just because I think he's going to run this entire offensive passing game. So if you are interested in getting the draft guide, you can do that at full price, bdge.co right now. But the easiest and the least expensive way to get it is by going to underdogfantasy.com or just downloading the Underdog Fantasy app. It'll be the first link down below and use our code BDGE. BDGE when you deposit $10 or more, which is a heavy, heavy discount on the full price draft guide, and you will get it emailed to you over for free. You will also get a free square of Lamar Jackson, half a passing yard for week one. So it's easy money right there that you're 
already winning back, basically. So you're almost getting this shit for free at this point. Plus, you'll get a deposit bonus up to $1,000 on Underdog, depending on how much you deposit. So full price, bdg.co or Underdog Fantasy for first-time depositors. So we move on to the Rams and the Texans, and neither of these teams played any fa- fantasy-relevant players in this one, but I think that's a little bit telling for a guy like Jordan Whittington, the rookie who's gotten a ton of hype out of Texas this offseason. He got started treatment. He did not play at all in this one, so it is clear to me that he's going to have a role in this offense. I don't know what it's going to look like, especially over the first half of the year, but if something were to happen to any of the receivers in this wide receiver group, he's going to step in and start producing immediately. He needs to be your 17th or 18th round pick in underdog best ball drafts every time you draft. He will be a waiver wire player at some point or another this year, as it seems like Cam Akers might be, man. He's been looking fucking good. And I again, I try not to look into uh, preseason stats, but sometimes... Sometimes, you know, this is why we play the game. We're trying to have a little bit of fun in this economy. Cam Akers is looking pretty good, man. There, there's there's a chance that Cam Akers ends up being the number two in Houston's backfield behind Joe Mixon. So just keep a close eye on what happens with the 53-man roster. Do they keep Joe Mixon and Damian Pierce and Cam Akers? Do they keep Akers and try to move Pierce? Like what happens here is going to be a really interesting cut down day discussion. The Chargers didn't play any fantasy relevant starters, which included Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, and Kamani Vidal. So it seems like Kamani Vidal is the RB3 over Jared Patterson, who played in this one. So we'll have to see if he even makes the roster. I expect him to, but that means for all y'all that were drafting Kamani Vidal early on, ah, the light bulb's still on. The hope is still alive. If we keep moving down, we've got uh, Seattle. We got Geno Smith playing five snaps, led a perfectly executed touchdown drive. And this was kind of the first glimpse into Ryan Grubb's like three wide receiver set offense. And that's exactly what happened, right? Geno Smith played five snaps and it was perfectly aligned. It was like a puzzle with all the pieces in the box of those five snaps. JSN, DK, and Jake Bobo, Tyler Lockett sat. Those three wide receivers played all five snaps. So it was good to see that kind of come to fruition. I think it gives you a little bit more confidence that, when the regular season does start, we will get a ton of three wide receiver sets. And they look really good. Again, I'm not trying to look at the production, but there were targets to JSN. There were targets to DK Metcalf, who had a nice touchdown. It's also probably worth noting, I guess, if you're in a much deeper league, that Jake Bobo seems to be in line for the wide receiver four job. So if anything happens to any of these three wide receivers, he will step in as the next guy up. And I think the last team we will cover that really had any fantasy relevant players going was the Tennessee Titans and Will Levis. We got two drives. 18 snaps. Tony Pollard played every single snap on the first drive. He was utilized kind of everywhere. They were putting him in the screen game. They were putting him in the passing game. They were giving him outside runs. They gave him the ball on the goal line, which he got in for a touchdown. Then Tajay Spears came in on the second drive. So he outsnapped him 11 to 7, but I'm not really reading too much into it. I think their game plan was most likely like Tony Pollard gets the entire first drive. Tajay Spears gets the entire second drive, although Pollard came in on a fourth and short. So I think he's clearly the starter. I think he's clearly the short yardage work guy, but both of them are definitely going to be using the passing game. And I think they just came in and Pollard's drive just happened to be longer. So I wouldn't like read too much into the out snapping, et cetera, et cetera. But it was a, it was a good offense to, to see. They used the screen game a lot. They were using play action a lot. They got Will Levis on the move a lot. So like I'm cautiously optimistic about the Tennessee like up-tempo offense underneath Brian Callahan for this one. And there wasn't much to take away from the receiving group. Calvin really played a lot. Traylon Burks actually led the team in snaps, but DeAndre Hopkins is supposedly going to be ready for week one, and he'll be the one that, that hits the bench. And then Tyler Boyd was their wide receiver three, plays out of the slot, and that is not something that we – haven't known right Tyler Boyd is coming over from Cincinnati where Brian Callahan came over so they came together Tyler Boyd's gonna be their slot wide receiver I think he's really underrated right now in in deeper leagues in PPR type leagues but yeah overall overall pretty quiet uh week three four preseason not a ton of injuries not a ton of like big player movement because we didn't have a, a ton of starters really playing in this one the next recap that we do is gonna be for week one of regular season holy guacamole we're keeping it kid friendly from here on out okay and the draft guide is kid friendly believe it or not all right so if you need the draft guide between now and the season kickoff you got your draft coming up go cop it at bdge.co or by downloading the underdog fantasy app and using code bdge when you deposit ten dollars or more deposit bonus lamar jackson free square for week one and the draft guide email to you both free i love y'all smoochies